Thanks, Alex, for leading us this morning. Thank you all for coming today and for uh, getting cozy this morning. Some of you are in shock today because some of you have been coming to this church for decades and you have never sat this close to the front ever in your whole life. And I want to let you know, we lived in Stratford for a number of years and went to the theater there. And I think the first five rows or so are usually called the splash zone, right? When the, when the speakers speak, it could get a little, you know, so just warning you, you're in that zone today. Except for you folks, you're row six back there. You should be, you should be safe. So, and let me just quickly say uh, to those who are, will be watching online this week, thanks for joining us this way as well. And our apologies for not having a full service this week. We can't live stream. But Lord willing, we'll be together next Sunday back in the auditorium, and uh, so we're looking forward to having you there as well. All right, let's turn to Genesis 13, please. Genesis chapter 13, as we continue our uh, study of the life of Abraham, this journey of faith that he is on. Genesis chapter 13. I want to start this morning by talking about this little guy you'll see on the screen here. He's a, he's a monkey, and zoologists tell us that he's one of the toughest monkeys to actually capture. He's called a ring-tailed monkey. But the Zulu people of uh, South Africa apparently have discovered a very simple and yet very uh, it, it, a way that works to capture these little monkeys. Apparently, they love the, the seeds of a particular melon. And so what the Zulu people have learned to do is they cut a very tiny hole into the side of the melon, just large enough for these little monkeys to get their hand in. And when they do, because they love the seeds, once they get their hand in, they rummage around and they get a fistful of seeds. And now they can't get their hand out because their fist is bigger than the hole. And do you think those little monkeys will let go of those seeds to get free? Oh, no, they won't. And that's how they're able to capture them. Okay, I have a very important question for you this morning. Have you got any melons in your life? Are you perhaps, have some stuff in your life you're hanging on to? And maybe some things that God says it's time to let those things go. We're going to talk about that this morning. And we're going to do it in the backdrop of Abraham's life. And we're going to see that he, on his journey of faith, he had some things he had to let go of. That was part of the journey and he's going to teach us this morning. So why don't we turn to Genesis 13, if you're there already. I'm going to read the first seven verses, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into this. Genesis 13, verse 1 says, So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar, there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And verse 7 says, quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. Let's pray. Lord, we commit this time now to you. We're thankful that we have your word. We're thankful that we have the example of Abraham. And we are asking this morning, Spirit of God, that you will teach us from this portion of his life, this experience he went through, that we could learn from that and then apply it to our lives and particularly our journey of faith. So again, uh, we ask, Spirit of God, that you'll be the teachers, teacher today, and we'll be the listeners, we'll be the learners, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to do a couple of things this morning. I want us to give you a bit of a narrative overline of this, or outline of this passage, uh, all of chapter 13. And then when we're done that, I want to try to talk about three very practical things that we need to let go of. So let's start with the overview, this narrative overview. Five things. Number one, I see in this passage a major conflict. There's a major conflict. Verse 5 tells us that Lot has been traveling with Abram. I want you to notice there in verse 5 that little word with. It also appears uh, up in verse 1 as well. Lot is with Abram. And that pretty much sums up his life, honestly. Uh, he was one of those guys that he didn't, he didn't really do his own thing. He was a spiritual shadow. He was a spiritual tag-along. He was with Abram. And sadly today, I just want to quickly say that there are Christians today who are like that. They're like Lot. 
some who never really build their own life of faith, some who never learn to feed themselves from the Word, some who just never develop their own prayer life. They never build their own altars. They never learn to stand on their own two spiritual feet. And that's where Lot is at. He is He's with Abraham. And in verse 5 also says that he had flocks and herds as well as Abraham. Of course, Abraham flocks and herds and cattle and donkeys. And apparently in verse 6, it tells us that there was more livestock than there was pasture land. There was too many animals for the land that was available. And so verse 7 says that there was now quarreling between Abram's herdsmen and, and Lot's herdsmen. And I want to suggest to you today that this is a major conflict. Let me give you three reasons why. First of all, it involved a lot of people. This conflict was not just between like two people, Abraham and Lot, but it involved their families. And it involved the herdsmen and their families. And so this conflict, in a very real way, had the potential of affecting multiple families and literally hundreds of lives. It was a major conflict. Number two, it involved a lot of money. What we're talking about here is their livelihood. And so this conflict is involving big business and big bucks. And I wonder if you've ever learned that conflicts get more complicated when money's involved. Have you ever found that to be true? Isn't that true? Someone once said this, before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need more. <laughs> and so this is, it's a conflict. It's major because there's money involved. And thirdly, it's, it's major because it involved family. It involved family. This is not some detached, impersonal, distant conflict. What we have here actually is a family fight, is what we have. Winston Churchill said this, you may know this, he said, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills. That sounds like a family vacation to me, I don't know what it sounds like to you. And, uh, you know, sometimes we laugh at that kind of a little thing, but if you're in the middle, right now, I know this, if you're in the middle of a family conflict, you're not laughing. There is nothing more painful, more heart-wrenching than a family conflict. And so this conflict is, is a major conflict. Number two, I want you to notice in the middle of this major conflict, there's a, what I would call a very mature response, a very mature response. Notice verses eight and nine. It says, so Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. We're family, right? Verse 9, is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now, let me, I want to be really, really clear on this. This is important. Right off the bat, I want to tell you that what Abraham just did there, verses 8 and 9, what he did there, he didn't have to do. Why? Because he's the elder statesman. He's the leader of the family. He's the patriarch. He's Uncle Abram to Lot. And so clearly it was Abram's place to make first choice, and it was Lot's place to submit to that choice and take whatever was left over. So the fact that Abraham gave Lot first choice, that says a lot about Abram. And the fact that Lot let him do this, it says a lot about Lot, doesn't it? So what should have happened when Abraham said, hey, you know what, let's separate, you go left, I'll go right, whatever. Lot should have said, no, 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 Uncle Abraham, no, no, no. Everything I have is because I'm attached to you. I I wouldn't have any of these belongings, any of these flocks and herds if it wasn't for your goodness. No, no, you choose first. You you do whatever you want, and I'll just, I'll take the leftovers. That's what he should have said. That's what he should have done. But he didn't. Instead, number three, he made what I would call a selfish choice. A very selfish choice. Notice verse 10. It says that Lot looked around... And he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered, like like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, and he set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Verse 10 says that Lot looked around, and he saw. What did he see? 
he saw the beautiful, fertile, green Jordan Valley. It says in verse 10, it was like the garden of the Lord. What's that? It's like Eden. It's like the Garden of Eden. It was so beautiful, so lush, lush pasture ground, uh, pasture, pasture land, abundant fresh water. He saw health, wealth, and prosperity. He, he lifted up his eyes and he saw a place, listen, that looked an awful lot like Egypt, where he'd just been. He saw what the world had to offer. And he chose the best for himself. I've heard of the, uh, we've had a lot of construction workers around here for the last number of months, in case you haven't noticed. Do you hear about the eight construction workers? They took a break for lunch. They went out for lunch, and they actually went to a little local diner. They took a little bit longer than normal, and uh, they all ordered their food. Two of the guys ordered the steak special. It was a lunch steak special. When the waitress came to the table, there was so many guys around this table, and, and she couldn't sort of get in, so she started passing the plates down. And the two steak specials got passed, and the first guy looked at these, these two plates, and one had a pretty big steak, and the second plate had a much smaller steak. And so he passed the smaller steak to his buddy. And immediately his buddy said, hey, what are, you, what are you doing? What kind of nerve? He says, what did I do? He says, well, you know what you did. You, you passed me the small steak and you kept the big steak for yourself. He says, well, what's wrong with that? What would you have done? He says, well, I would, have, I would have kept the small steak for me and I would have given you the bigger steak. And he said, well, you got the smaller steak. What is the problem with you? It says that here that Lot chose the best for himself. It says in verse 10, he saw the whole plain, the whole plain. It says in verse 11, he chose the whole plain. It says in verse 11, he chose for himself. That's the epitaph on his tombstone. He chose for himself. You know, Abraham offered Lot a choice, and Lot says, I choose everything. Abraham said, hey, would you like a piece of the pie? Lot says, thanks very much. I'm going to take the whole pie. He chose the best for himself. It was a really selfish choice. Verse 11, so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Verse 12, Abram uh, lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked. They were sinning greatly against the Lord. So there's a parting of the way between these two families. Lot and his entourage leave. And verse 12 tells us that Lot pitched his tents near Sodom. Now that didn't last very long. In fact, the very next chapter, chapter 14, verse 12 tells us that now Lot had moved into Sodom. He pitched his tents near Sodom, and it wasn't long before he was now living in Sodom. And worse than that, now Sodom actually moved into him. He moved into Sodom. Sodom moved into him. And it destroyed him and his family and his walk with God. And we're, not gonna, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but that's where it took him. At this point, though, as he made this decision, at this point, it does look like Abraham's got the short end of the stick. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, Lot has got the best land. But I want you to notice what God does next. This is really encouraging. Verse 14, the Lord, verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are, to the north and the south, to the east and the west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abraham has another fresh encounter with God, doesn't he? He's had a few of these. He has a fresh encounter with the Lord. Verse 14 says, the Lord spoke to him. And I want you to notice that it was after Lot had left. After Lot had made his selfish choice, after Lot says, I'm going to choose the way of the world, it was then that God showed up and said, Abraham, in case you're wondering whether you've been swindled by your 
spineless little nephew. Maybe God didn't say all of that, but that was sort of the idea. He said, I want to give you something. I want to give you a divine perspective. That's the fourth thing, a divine perspective. Verse 14 says, he says to Abraham, I want you to, I want you to lift up your eyes, Abraham. I want you to look around, Abram. Now, by the way, I feel like, didn't we just read that? I think we just read that back in verse 10. It says in verse 10 that Lot looked up and he saw. Lot looked around. And now God says, Abram, now that Lot's had his turn, now that he's chosen Sodom, now that he's chosen selfishness, I want you to lift up your eyes. And I want you to look around. And don't just look east. I want you to look north and south and west because, Abram, guess what? It's all yours. All of it. As far as your eye can see, I'm giving it to you. You better have a 360 perspective because that's where my goodness is going to land on your life, all over the place. And with God's help, Abraham did what we read about in the Old Testament. He mounted up on wings as an eagle. And he began to see things from God's perspective. Not, not the human perspective, but God's perspective. And out of that perspective, number five, he gave the, Abraham the ability to, make a, to go a godly direction. That's the fifth thing. A godly direction. Verse 18 says that Abram went live to near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents. And there he built an altar to the Lord. I cannot miss the contrast in these few verses. Verse 12 says that Lot made a choice. He moved. He pitched his tents near Sodom. Abraham also moved. Verse 18, he pitched his tents. And what did he do? He built an altar. And there's two different choices, isn't it? Two different lifestyles. Two different priorities. A godly direction. A godly direction is the choice he made. So there's our narrative. There's what happens in this story as to what went on. But let's move from that now into three applications, three things that that I think that allowed this to happen, three things that Abram had to let go of in order to get to this place. Uh, Here's the first one. Maybe I can call these three melons we need to let go of. (laughs) Here's the first melon. Let go of self-sufficiency. Let go of self-sufficiency. I think one of the most tantalizing melons that Satan will put before us on our journey of faith is a melon called pride. And pride says, I can do it myself. I I don't really need God's help. I might every once in a while tap in if it's really bad. But basically, I can live my life and I can do it myself. And we saw actually an example of that just two weeks ago back in the previous chapter. Remember how uh, there was a, a famine in the land? And Abraham, he didn't call upon the Lord. What did he do? He, he made a unilateral decision, and he moved to Egypt, and he made a decision to do that, and that decision caused him all kinds of problems and his family problems literally for years to come. He made a wrong turn. Thankfully, he made a U-turn, and he came back to Bethel, and he came back to the altar. Chapter 13 begins, if you notice verse 4, he came back to, to Bethel, back to the place where he had built an altar. There he called on the name of the Lord. He's at an altar. And at the end of this chapter, chapter 4, verse 18, he's again, he's building an altar. He's learning, you know what I got to do? I got to let go. And I got to let God. He's learning, I, I can't handle life by myself, or I shouldn't try to try to live my life simply in my own effort. I wonder if you've ever learned that lesson yet. Have you learned the lesson that says, I don't have to do it by myself? There's resources. There's power available to me. There's wisdom available to me. God wants to give me this. He wants to give me peace and strength and power and perspective. But I have to let go of a melon called pride that says, I can handle this all by myself. I asked the question, how do you know, if, you're, if you got your fist inside a melon called pride, how do you know that you're living that way? I think it's very simple, and I see it right in the text here. When you stop building altars, you're living in your own strength. When you stop building altars, what does that look like? Well, when, you, when worship, being with God's people is no longer a priority, 
When you don't spend time in God's Word anymore, you're not interested in hearing from Him. You have other things to do. When your prayer life is non-existent, when you have gifts and abilities, but you're not using them to serve the Lord, man, you're building your own empire. When you stop building altars, it's a revelation that you're living your own life in pride. Abraham's life was built around altars. An unknown author has put it this way. I love this. It's so simple. When a child of God looks into the Word of God and sees the Son of God, he's changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. Isn't that good? It's that simple. Spending time with the Lord, spending time in His Word, spending time in prayer, spending time in fellowship, and God begins to transform you and change you. But you got to let go of self-sufficiency. you got to get let go of pride. And you got to learn to hang on to God. Number two, second melon. <laughs> I see Abraham, he lets go of control. He lets go of control. Now, for all of you control freaks out there, you're freaking out right now. What do you mean let go of control? I can't, that's how I live my life. That's who I am, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm one of them at times. Ask my wife after the service. We can have a testimony time. And she say, yeah, yeah, there's... Oh, to let go of control. This is, this is not pride. This is power. This is our tendency to say, I, I, I really, I want to get my own way. I want to control the situation. I, I, I'll manipulate things to make sure I, I win. Oh, that's, a, that's an exhausting way to live. When you can let go of that and say, you know what, God, I'm going to do my part, but your will be done. When you get to that place, oh, it's a place of peace and of, of surrender. So I want to ask you this morning, do you have any conflicts in your life? Is, are there any points of tension, like between you know, Lot and Abram here, are, do, are there any t- points of tension, stress in your life between you and somebody else? I, I read a cute story of two men who were having a terrible dispute, terrible conflict. They could not resolve it. And so they went to the local sage in town to try to see if he could help resolve the situation. The first man came in, explained the whole situation, his story, his side of the thing. And the sage looked at him and said, you know what? You're absolutely right. He left. Second man came in, and of course, as always happens, he tells the other side of the story, what his perspective, what he thinks was happening. And after he had told his whole story, the sage looked at him and said, you know what? You're absolutely right. After the second man left, his wife, who had been listening from the other room, came into the room where they had been meeting, and she said, what is wrong with you? These two guys told two totally different stories, and you said to both of them, you're absolutely right. They can't both be right. And the sage looked at his wife and said, you're absolutely right. (laughs) Conflict, control in the midst of conflict... What does letting go of control look like? This may not be in your notes, but you might want to jot these down because I see it in the text. First of all, I think letting go of control when you're in conflict, it means you initiate initiate, um, communication to try to resolve the problem. You initiate communication to try to resolve the problem. Look at verse 8. So Abram said to Lot... Let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine. We are, I mean, we're close relatives. We're family. But what I notice here is that Abram initiated the communication. He knew things were not good. He could sense the tension mounting. And he took the initiative to try to resolve the situation. He made the first move. Question, does anybody here have a hard time doing that? struggle with doing that. You're lying in bed with your spouse at nighttime. You've had a rough day. You've had a little fight of some sort and tension. And I'm lying there thinking, is she going to say something? (laughs) Or am I going to say something? And many times I think we struggle to make the first move because we think it's a sign of weakness. I mean, if I make the first move, it's going to look like I think I'm wrong and they're right. It's a sign of weakness. Nothing could be further from the truth. When you make the first move, it shows you're strong. It shows you're mature. It shows you're, you're listening to the Lord. When you make the first move, you're acting like God. 
1 John, we love God because he, what, first loved us. He initiated, he initiates contact all the time to bring about healing to the relationship. That's what, why Jesus came. And so God made the first move, God initiated, and that's what he calls us to do. Can I say very quickly as well, the letting go of this control not only is about initiating the, the communication when things are not good, but also it means when you get there, you're willing to give up your rights in that communication. You're willing to give up your rights. That's exactly what Abraham did here. But I want to park on this really quickly to explain what I mean, lest you kind of go some maybe wrong places on this. Letting go of your rights does not mean you roll over and play dead. Letting go of your rights does not mean you don't have a spiritual backbone or don't have any conviction. It's not about that. And so if your friend at school suggests after school that you go to Walmart because they want to steal something and they want you to come with them, you say, no, because God's word says, thou shalt not steal. Like, it's right there. Or if your teacher is upset because you don't uh, get all excited and believe the Big Bang Theory, and they're uptight with you and upstressed with you, you, you hold firm. Why? Because the word of God says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what does it mean? Please write this down. It's in your notes. In matters of theological absolutes or biblical morals, you stand firm. You stand firm. But <laughs> here's the tough part. In all other matters, be willing to give up your rights. So if it's a, a doctrinal issue, if it's a, a moral issue where God has been clear, you stand firm. But in a lot of other areas where it's two opinions, be willing to relinquish your rights. That means you don't start World War III at work over the carpet color. You don't do that. That means you don't destroy your marriage because you can't agree on a vacation destination. That means you don't hinder the work of the Spirit at church because you aren't getting your personal preference. You give up your rights. Paul said it this way, Philippians 2. I think it's on your notes. Is it there? Okay, let's read this one together. Don't be selfish. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. There it is, putting the other person first and, and, and they're putting their perspective into, into your heart and mind and what they're interested in. So letting go of always having to win, letting go of always having to control a situation. There's a third one very quickly. I think Abraham very intentionally here, he let go of stuff. He let go of stuff. He let Lot go first, choose first. And so in, very, in a very real way, Abram let go of the riches of the Jordan Valley. He let go of stuff that this world says not only is important, but stuff that the world says, if you have this stuff, it'll give you security. It'll give you stability. He let go of all of that stuff. But he hung on to God, didn't he? Let go of all the stuff, hung on to the Lord. Jesus talked about this. Let's turn quickly to Matthew 6. We're almost done. Matthew 6, and then we'll wrap it up here. My journey of faith is not about stuff. Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 6, 24. Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, verse 25, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothes? And if you jump over to verse 31... So don't worry, Jesus says, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So let me wrap up with a final question. 
Genesis 13 verse 10 says that Lot looked up and he saw. Genesis 13 14 says that Abraham looked up. He lifted his eyes and, and, and he saw. My question to you is this, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Lot was looking for power, pleasure, popularity, prosperity. He was looking for stuff the world says is important and essential to your well-being. What are you looking for? Are you chasing stuff? Or are you, like Jesus says here, you say, no, I'm going I'm to seek his kingdom. I'm going to pursue his righteousness. And I'm going to trust God to provide me the stuff that I absolutely need. I guess my question is this. Are you willing to let go? Are you willing to just let go and let God and trust him? I'm going to close this morning with a final little poem here. Um, and you'll see on the screen here a couple of hands. This poem, it's an unknown author, but it's called Empty Hands. Let me read it to you, and then I'll pray. One by one, he took them from me, all the things I valued most. Until I was empty-handed, every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highway, grieving in my rage and poverty, till I heard his voice inviting, lift your empty hands to me. So I held my hands towards heaven, and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent riches until they could, they could hold no more. And at last I comprehended with my muddled mind so dull that God could not pour his riches into hands already full. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today that there are seasons in our life where you put a test in front of us. You want to know, are you going to pursue an altar or are you going to pursue stuff? Are you going to trust yourself or are you going to trust me? You're wondering. Are you going to try and control the situation? Or are you going to pray and allow me to work? Lord, we confess today that we have a lot of lot running through our veins. Fleshly desires, selfish intentions, trying to do it ourselves. Lord, I pray that you will kill that part of us and grow in us this spirit of Abraham, this increasing faith and confidence in you, even when it looks like or feels like we're being ripped off or misunderstood or maligned, even when it looks like the world's getting ahead and we're not, that we would trust you and that we would discover that when it's all said and done, if we have you, we have everything. So thanks again for this time in your word. Thanks for Abraham. What an example. Thank you, Lord. He's not perfect. He doesn't do it right all the time, but he's growing, learning, and that's what we would pray for ourselves today. Bless us now as we sing our final song. Encourage our hearts as we consider you and your sufficiency in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.